Ten years ago today, the day everything changed. The banks were bailed out, the financial system flirted with oblivion. This country's unhappiest economic saga began. Had the banks not been rescued, it, it would have been unimaginably desperate. The entire system was not working and was going to collapse. People were visibly scared. We were right on the brink, right on the edge. But a decade on, we are still asking the question, have we really recovered? Why is the economy still so weak? Why are so many people talking not about regeneration, but about decay? Nobody can see a promising future, so nobody dare plan for the future too far ahead. Austerity, it's, it's, it's been a huge problem. When I become homeless, it really did open up my eyes. So we're asking whether the past decade should really be thought of as Britain's Great Depression. For the people in charge ten years ago, the scars can still be felt today. I suppose the most vivid memory is the morning of the 8th of October ten years ago when I took a call from the then chairman of RBS. The bank was hemorrhaging money, it was a run on it, its shares had been suspended in the stock exchange, and he said, what are you going to do about it? And I said, how long can you last? And there was a pause and he said, we're going to run out of money in the afternoon. If people worry and try and withdraw lots of cash, can you fill them quickly enough? Also security issues around if people are going to take sort of bundles of cash around. There was a lot of talk about there's going to be a great depression like the early 1930s. I knew there wasn't going to be because I knew that we knew what not to do and what to do. When people say that our politicians, our then Prime Minister and Finance Minister, stepped into the breach and avoided a complete disaster, I think that's basically true. But now, new analysis from Sky News underlines the scale of that crisis. These lines show you the path of GDP, how the size of the economy changed in a few famous British recessions from history, the 90s and the 30s. A dip, then a recovery. But now look at these lines. The red one is the recent crisis. The blue one is the American Great Depression that began with the 1929 Wall Street crash. Our recent recession was far less deep or dramatic than the American 1930s. But look at what happened next. The US economy bounced back quickly in the 1930s, dipped slightly and then surged again, while Britain simply failed to take off after this crisis. The upshot is that this year, a decade on from the slump, Britain's cumulative growth is now smaller than America's was 10 years after the Great Depression. It's a staggering statistic, and perhaps that explains why even now, 10 years on, some workers feel the country has never truly recovered. The steel industry suffered a deeper crisis than most. Today, veteran steel workers feel they're constantly fighting for survival. Just pure worry. You don't know where you're going, what you're going to do. You don't know if you've got a job next week. I mean, we lost a lot of money in 2008, 2009, and just don't know what's happening. Your life's on hold. Well, it's been tough for my family in the sense that my son lost his job. He was with me when the plate mill shot. Um, it's come to my brother-in-law lost his job. How much money did they actually pour into the banks to bail the banks out, the government? We've had nothing. The answer, by the way, is £133 billion, or more than a trillion by some measures. The idea was we'd all benefit, but try telling that to these guys. A place like Scunthorpe, he said, there's just nothing there. You take that steelworks away, you've got a ghost town. There's just nothing. There's that many men out to work. So they decide to sell their houses. House prices for Guess the point where you can't sell your house because there's nobody up there where anybody wants to buy it. I always remember in 2008 we started weathering the storm and I still believe that we're still weathering the storm. I don't think that we've ever come out of it. We've never seen, seen no sunshine. So why? Was it the crisis, the banks, or what happened after? The cuts. We must pay down this deficit. This emergency budget deals decisively with our country's record debts. Yes, it is tough, but it is also fair. If you don't know what the deep cause is, you've got to find solutions that will help whatever the deep cause is. The real cost to the United Kingdom is the economic cost of how they handled the years that followed. And the obvious thing to do would have been spending on the infrastructure. 
they thought they could eliminate the deficit in, in a five-year period, which I think is wildly optimistic. Austerity, cutting government borrowing, arguably the most controversial economic policy in recent years. But away from the boardrooms and the statistics, what does it actually feel like on the ground? We get loads of support um, from the local community, local schools, churches. And Kerry runs a homeless charity in Harlow, offering everything from a warm meal to help with job applications. The government says, well, listen, we've, we've got through the, the worst of it. Things are getting better now. Do you, do you recognise that kind of on the ground? I don't think we're seeing that just yet. Right. Not here. The average number of homeless people sleeping on the streets on any night in 2010 was six. Um, we've just reviewed our figures now and for our last financial year the average number of homeless people on any given night in Harlow was 23. So okay, wow. Okay, so it's kind of it's quite an fat, increase and that's so, been yeah. increasing year on year on year, not right. only in Harlow but, you know, across the UK. A challenge, in other words, which seems to be getting worse, not better for those who've had to live out on the streets. It's hard. I mean, sometimes I was sitting there, it was so cold in my tent. I was sitting there thinking of just about like, committing a petty crime to get myself thrown in prison, like, to get out of the cold. Yeah, that's how bad it can get. Um, some people, I've known actually people to actually go ahead and do that. Like, all this about eradicating it in 2022, <laughs> it's not going to happen. It really ain't, unless someone really steps in and starts pumping some money into this. <laughs> It's not going to happen yeah. when there's always, uh, the way I see it, where, where there's rich people, there will always be poor people. But tough as it is, according to Rupert Harrison, George Osborne's chief advisor and one of the architects of austerity, the pain was unavoidable. We can't think about what happened 10 years ago as a sort of sudden event that hit the UK economy from out of the blue. Uh, this was the culmination of a decade, at least in the UK, of a very, very unbalanced model of growth. Austerity was not a choice, it was a situation the UK found itself in. We found ourselves in 2010 as probably the most vulnerable major economy in the world uh, and we had to make some very difficult choices and they were very, very controversial. The macroeconomic story in the UK has been a successful one. I think the challenges we face are longer term and more global. The funny thing is, that's not a defence you hear much in politics at all these days. Indeed, the politics forged by the crisis are very different to what came before. What you've seen is a growth of populism. It's not confined to this country and Brexit. It's, you know, it's right across the globe. From the uh, election of Donald Trump and then the uh, protectionism that we have here, the Brexit vote in Britain, populism, anti-immigrant feeling around uh, uh, Europe. The last few years, I've really felt that I actually want to make some kind of change. and. Um, and I want to make a change here in Harlow. Campaigners from Momentum, the left-wing group so influential in the Labour Party, believe the past decade has proven the need for change. Campaigners like Laura. We've seen the rich get richer as the poor get poorer, definitely since the recession ten years ago. I don't think we're out of the recession. Certainly it still feels like we're in the recession in Harlow. There's no affordable housing. Um, a lot of the manufacturing ha is, has gone offshore. Um, and I think that actually that's one of the Labour Party's policies, is to bring back manufacturing to the UK. I hope you don't mind me saying this. Sounds, some of that sounds a bit like the kind of message that Donald Trump is... Uh, <laughs> is, is the intriguing thing is these kinds of concerns about the role of capitalism aren't just to be found amongst left-wing activists, but also in the highest echelons of the establishment. The economy, the capitalist system, is not delivering for ordinary people in the way it seemed to be doing uh, before 2007. And that's the crisis which I think is still unresolved. I think people are legitimately angry about something that's gone deeply wrong with capitalism. We have a whole load of people who, in 2018, have real wages which are below where they were in 2007, and in the case of America, some of them below where they were back in the 1980s. And blaming everything on austerity isn't quite fair. What if there's something else going on? What if the financial crisis was simply the moment we realised there was a deeper problem in the economy? Quite simply, we're not productive enough. 
we're fundamentally building products that will go to milking cows, to packaging crisps, to cutting metal, to putting a conformal coating onto a mobile phone to make it waterproof. Tony Haig runs a high-tech manufacturing firm in the Midlands. As with so many others, he still bears the scars from a decade ago. It was an incredibly fraught period. Uh, never before so in our industry had we seen such a, you know, a, a global economic meltdown. It wasn't just a recession in one industry, it was far more than that. I mean, to put it into context, in the space of four weeks, we saw a 70% reduction in orders from our customers. So four weeks? In four weeks, 70% reduction. A lot of manufacturing companies that were, you know, really good manufacturing businesses ten years ago, and now they're the site of a supermarket, a petrol station or a housing estate because they didn't do the right things, they did all the wrong things, they didn't invest and ultimately they couldn't compete and they closed. In other words, was the crisis just another excuse for businesses not to invest in their future? It's a concern for UK manufacturing in general because you know, we now all of us work in a global economy and if they're not investing in automation, not doing the right things, will you be there in five years? The Great Depression is rightly remembered as one of the worst catastrophes in economic history. So whether you blame the banks, austerity or weak productivity, is it really fair to compare Britain's past decade with that? The last 10 years have been grim for all of our economies. Some grimmer for some than for others. But, but thank God we did not revisit the Great Depression. We didn't have, you know, a third of the entire banking system just collapsing and defaulting. That's what happened in America in 1929, and that's what happens when you simply say, I'm not going to spend any public money on rescuing a banking system, just let it, let it fall. We avoided the banking system collapsing, but then, of course, the bigger problem, actually, if people say, what's wrong today, is the economic crisis uh, that flowed out of the financial crisis. But what if, after 10 years of struggle, it's now time to celebrate? What if the cuts are finally about to come to an end? After the financial crash, people need to know that the austerity it led to is over and that their hard work has paid off. <clears throat> well, we'll see. But while we may not have faced the extremes of destitution America faced in the 30s, it's clear that Britain's very different type of depression is not quite over yet. <laughs>